Hey guys, we're going to go into 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 to 12 today. And so if you're doing this at home with your discipleship group as an extension, make sure you take the time to go through that look back section, as well as the look ahead section at the end of this message. Um, in J.R.R. Tolkien's book, The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, there's a poem that speaks of a prophecy concerning one of the main characters, who's known in the book as Strider. Um, he's actually the heir to the throne, though everybody just thinks he's a wandering uh, ranger. And the quote is actually quite famous. You even see it on the back of cheap Wranglers, like on the tire cover, though it's probably most people have no clue. Maybe they know where it's from, but probably most people have no clue. They just think it's witty. But the full um, two, first two stanzas of the poem goes like this. All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. That's the famous quote. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken. A light from the shadow shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. So were you to spend some time thinking about that poem and discerning the intended meaning, you would see that it actually speaks of the truth of this idea that things that may appear rough or they may appear dirty are actually good and precious. And so, for example, you can have a gold-laden, gaudy facade that is actually just hiding something worthless underneath, but then a diamond will not shine until it's polished. So in the book, The Lord of the Rings, Strider is actually the rightful king, but he appears to just be this wandering, homeless sojourner. So why do I share about this? Well, it's been just about a year since all of this began to unfold around us with the coronavirus. And it feels like in the last year, everything has just snowballed from viral things to racial things to political things. And it seems like there's no end in sight. And the truth is that I've been depressed and I've been anxious and I've talked to myself because I'm a pastor logically out of both of those things. But the reality is it's been difficult that many days I wake up and I feel like a bucket filled with gaping holes at the bottom. And I wake up eager to be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. You know, I get up in the morning to spend time in the word and in prayer and journaling only to feel depleted in a very brief matter of time. Now, this is a dangerous place to be, as you know, because Jesus said it is the worries and concerns of life that choke out our fruit, as he shared the parable of the sower. How much fruit's already been lost because of worry? But it does, us no, it does the disciple no good to expend unnecessary energy on pondering those things and just dwelling in regret. The reality is that we are wandering in the wilderness right now, aren't we? Don't you feel that? At times, you think about how the Israelites were brought out of Egypt by a mighty exodus only to wander for 40 years in the wastelands. I'm sure there's been times over the last year where you feel like God is silent. There's been times when you feel isolated and alone. There's been t times when you feel like you are wandering. But the question is not if you are wandering. The question is, are you lost? Steve, one of our elders, reminded me this week, there's a big difference between being aimless and just being in the wilderness. Now, we need to realize that being a wanderer is actually part of our identity in Jesus. But being lost and aimless is not. And so we can still have this firm goal in mind even while we wander in the unknown. And so enter 1 Peter, which we've been studying for the last few weeks. And today we're going to look at verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2. So after reminding his readers in the preceding verses of their glorious identities, he calls them living stones, royal priests, recipients of mercy, that they're the new people of God, even though they weren't a people. Peter now brings them full circle in verse 11 to the identity that he, he introed in the beginning of the letter in the first few verses of chapter 1. This is what we read in 1 Peter 2, 11. Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, 
so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. See, God's people, dearly beloved by Peter and by the Lord Jesus, are sojourners and exiles. If you were going to look sojourner up in the dictionary, you would find that it's someone who resides in a particular place temporarily, whereas an exile is defined as someone who has been barred from their own native country. Now, an astute, attentive reader should note that these two identities are less savory than that of royal priest and holy nation. We like those identities. These ones we don't like as much. Nevertheless, they are just as true of all believers as the others. Suffering, restlessness, disappointment, a yearning for something more, some unmet hope for the future, all of this is as much a part of our identity as are the other more encouraging descriptors that we have explored in the previous weeks. See, Adam was the first exile. He was forcibly displaced from the Garden of Eden. Abram was sent as a sojourner into a far country yet to be seen. Jacob labored as a migrant under the abusive control of his father-in-law. Joseph was, Joseph was sold as a slave to a land that was not his own in Egypt. Moses himself dwelt in the wilderness for 40 years after trying to take the issue of deliverance into his own hands. And then he had to die in the wilderness another 40 years past after the entire nation was subjected subjected to punitive sojourning following their own disobedience. Under the monarchy, the entire nation of Israel would be exiled under the oppressive boot of Assyria and Babylon. King David had to suffer a temporary exile after his son basically kicked him off the throne. But it's not always sin that causes sojourning. It's opportunity as well, like with Abram or with Jesus. Jesus sojourned. He traveled around Israel. He said that even foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, speaking of himself, has nowhere to rest his head. Jesus was a sojourner. Jesus was a nomad. Jesus was a wandering king. Jesus knew he was just passing through until he would be able to return home. See, it is this type of sojourning that I just described with Jesus that Peter has in his mind, as well as the author of Hebrews, when he says that we are simply pilgrims on our way to the city of God. What we need to realize as we wrestle with the identities of exile and sojourner is this. In this life, we may feel as though we are wandering, but we do have a clear destination despite our wandering. The people in the Old Testament were wandering in the desert knowing their children would go into the promised land. We too wander knowing we will enter the promised land. And now we have an aim. We aim for the glory of God knowing with confidence, not with some kind of wistful thinking, but with confidence that we will see the glory of God fully unveiled. And the spiritual tools that he's given to us, like the word and, and, and prayer and the spirit of God and, and proclamation and love, these are to be employed by God's people regardless of where we wander, of how long we wander, or even of why we wander. Let's look at those verses, verses 11 and 12 again. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. See, Peter employs his audience. In light of your identity as a stranger in this world, pay close attention to your conduct among the Gentiles. Specifically, he says to abstain from the passions of the flesh and to keep their conduct honorable. I met Hassan in Greece in the Moria refugee camp just um, about two years ago. We spent First, we spent time together while on a vision trip. I met Hassan and he was helping us put together tents for new refugees, something to pass the day, pass the time. We were then blessed to reunite with him a few months later when the elders took the vision trip back to Greece. And that was just a few days prior to his departure from Greece to Sweden. 
where he would finally be reunited with his son, where Hassan and his wife and his daughter and his other son hadn't seen their teenage son in a few years. See, having survived the almost two-year process from leaving his home country of Afghanistan and then being in Moria and then finally receiving documentation permission to not only leave the camp but to travel to Sweden to seek refugee status, Hassan and his family now face deportation. You see, since uh, President Obama removed the status of war from Afghanistan, which to us and the UN is simply a title on a paper, since that point in time, Hassan and his family are now no longer classified as illegal migrants, instead are classified as refugees. Although Hassan, or instead of being classified as a refugee, rather, they're classified as illegal migrants. And so although Hassan was a refugee when he first left Afghanistan, as was his son, he's now considered to be an illegal immigrant. Despite all of the hardships that would face him at home, including being having his sons forced recruiting under penalty of death from al-Qaeda, the government has determined that he has no legal reason to stay in the country since it's not classified as a place of war. So now Hassan waits for appeals. And in the process, by the way, on a good note, Hassan and his whole family have come to faith. Why do I share this random story? Because the first thing you need to realize is that being in exile or a sojourner is a dangerous thing to be. As an exile, you are always at the mercy of the nation in which you're currently residing. You're always an outsider. You're always viewed as a threat. You're always viewed as unwelcome. You're always viewed as a minority. As an exile, the only people who truly understand you are other exiles. They've walked the road you've walked. Others have not. Christians similarly are exiles. We're sojourners. You will never fit in with your host country or your host culture. There's something intrinsically different in our new identity now that we've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit that makes us stand out as square pegs in a round hole regardless of where we live. And that may be, that may be more pronounced in some cultures than others. But the point is this. The culture of the world will always be, in some capacity, hostile to followers of Christ. This is not our home. We are travelers. We are wanderers. We are sojourners. We are exiles. And the last thing we need to do is draw more attention to ourselves. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, we should strive to live a quiet life. Now, quiet does not mean silent. Peter just got done saying that God gave you new identities that you may proclaim his excellencies in the gospel. So he doesn't mean silence. So what does Paul mean versus Peter? Are they contradicting each other? Not at all. For Peter, living a quiet life means living a life of integrity and an honorable life, which is why he says to abstain from the passions of the flesh and to live honorably as you live among the Gentiles. Abstaining from the passion of the flesh means to be on guard against the temporary pleasures of life. I want you to hear me because Jesus says the same thing in the parable of the sower. The pleasures of life, <coughs> the desires of other things, are not evil in and of themselves. The main passions of the flesh, these are not things that are evil to do. These are not vices. These are gifts of God. These are the enjoyments of relationships. This is the basic meat and potatoes of life, enjoying coffee and a garden and reading and decorating, um, investing in your home and investing in your future, traveling and enjoying a good book and TV and shopping on the internet and exercising and having hobbies that you love to do and spending time with friends. These are the pleasures of life and each and every one of them, if not kept in submission to the King of Kings, can be deadly and can quite efficiently eviscerate your soul. See, when Jesus speaks of what holds a man back from following him in the book of Luke, it is not fear of death. It is not persecution, but it is a brand new field that needs to be inspected, a set of oxen that needs to be retrieved, and a new wife. Those are the threats. See, these days we've had a great number of enjoyable things stripped from our lives, hobbies, 
going out to eat, even school, all of these things have been impacted, and many more. And as sojourners, living out of a tent with only the bare essential strapped to our camel, isn't it enticing to just say, let's settle down in Babylon. Let's enjoy our life like everyone else. They're not worried about it. They're just going on and doing their thing. Isn't it a very real temptation to succumb to the temporary pleasures of the flesh? Of course it is. It's a very real temptation, and it can kill your soul. Hear me. The greatest enemy of a hunger for God is not poison, but the appetizers. The stuff that keeps you full so you have no appetite for the main course of the glory of God. But Peter mentions something else besides just abstaining from the passions of the flesh, which, like I said, can be either terribly evil things or very normal things that God gave as gifts but we make into idols. Peter says to live honorably among the Gentiles so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And so we should draw a few things from this clause. First, they will speak against you. Indeed, Matthew 10, 18, you will be dragged before governors. So, where is it? You will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. God has a purpose in the fact that they will speak evil against us so that they drag us before the authorities so that we have an opportunity to bear witness before them. This is part of God's plan. <laughs> the world is not your friend. Okay? The world is not your friend. It never was your friend. The world, biblically, is classified as the kingdom of Satan. We should pray for it. We should have compassion on it. We should be kind to it. We should demonstrate love without measure, just like Jesus did. And But we should not be in love with it. The world despises you, even if it doesn't realize it yet. And one day, the world will turn on you like a wolf to a sheep. That's the first thing. Second, Peter is assuming that you have good deeds. He says, live honorably among the Gentiles. He's assuming that we should be living a good life, a life of love, a life of kindness, a life of compassion, because these things have great value. An angry life has no value. A bitter life has no value. But a good life, a life of integrity, is honorable and it has value. But what value? That's the question. What value do I have? Because it does not end up getting you what you want. If you choose to be above reproach, if you choose the ethical road, if you choose the road of integrity, I'm going to be honest with you. It will not get you what you want in this life. I can assure you that if you always do the right thing, you will not end up on top, but at the bottom. You will not be the hero nor the victor in this world, but you will be counted as great in the kingdom of God. For many who are first will be last, and many who are last shall be first. Which leads us to the third thing, which is that your integrity will pay off when Jesus comes back. You may not experience it today, but one day you will. It will be a testimony to your faith even in the midst of unfounded accusations. So what does this mean for us? these two verses. Well, right now we are experiencing a lot. We are all weary. We have been privileged in the United States to, for the most part, enjoy religious freedom and have no real threat of severe persecution. But that's not your identity. Perhaps what we are missing most in our faith as Americans is a theology and understanding of suffering, which is non-negotiable. In the New Testament. Indeed, 2 Timothy 3.12 says all who seek to live a godly life will be persecuted as a promise. See, instead of growing frustrated as we look around the world, instead of growing angry as I've been doing, as many of us have been doing, we need to embrace the reality that my identity is a sufferer, is a wanderer, is a sojourner, and is an exile, but I'm also a conqueror in Christ, not necessarily in this world. 
And so what do we learn as sojourners? And there's just three things I want to emphasize before we wind down. One, sojourners are wandering, but they aren't aimless. Listen, we know where we are going. We're headed to the new Jerusalem. We are headed to the far country to go and be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who went ahead to prepare a place for us, and he's coming back to retrieve his bride. You may feel as though the church has changed and your life has no meaning or aim right now, but that's a lie. The goal hasn't changed. We exist to glorify God by making disciples who make disciples until the whole world hears. Are the hurdles different? Absolutely. Do we need to change our tactics? Yes, we need to shift and change and mobilize. But let us not grow weary of doing good because we will reap a harvest in the right season if we do not give up. Now listen, I refuse to lay down and die from apathy. But if I go to jail, let it be for preaching the gospel and not for refusing to wear a mask. Live and die for something that matters. And what matters these days is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Revolve hasn't lost its oomph, but it is struggling. But Jesus is still building his church, and Revolve has no guarantees. My goal is not to plow my way back to the ruins of Jerusalem, but to teach you to thrive in Babylon. While we wait, for the restoration of all things on this pilgrimage. In other words, I am far more concerned with how to equip you to function in the most certain impending calamity than to stop it. We don't know if this is the beginning of the end or if this is just part of the downward spiral, but we know it doesn't get better. The second thing is this, sojourners have no space nor time for excess. Listen, when you need to travel long distances, you travel light. When I travel internationally, it's like a big joke with the guys who I tend to travel with because I, I obsess over what I should pack or shouldn't pack. And, and now I basically bring a Jansport backpack. If I go away for two weeks, everything that I'm bringing is fitting in a backpack that's small, a 30 liter backpack. See, so much of what we thought we needed to do to do church was just extra. God has taught us in the last year that we can actually make do with a whole lot less. We don't need a permanent location, even though it's nice. We don't need all the bells and whistles and programs and videos, even though they are enjoyable. And actually, there are incredible benefits to being trim and thin. Thin, Like, for example, radical generosity. You know, what if God knows that the pace of end times is quickening, like Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 3. What if, if, Jesus, if God the Father knows that the return of Jesus is on the horizon, and so God has orchestrated us to lose our location for such a time as this without losing any of our giving so that we can give more locally and internationally so that his fame is continually spread? Wouldn't that be just like God to do something like that? Isn't that worth it? Isn't that better isn't it amazing to be a people defined by radical, nonsensical generosity? Sojourners have the freedom to do that because they have less stuff tying them down. You're a sojourner. And the third thing I want to point is that sojourners need to stick together. Look, these days are hard. Being in the service with your kids, it's difficult. Sitting out in the cold, it's a challenge. We need one another. Exiles stick together. Sojourns travel with others. Refugees don't go at it alone, but they band together with other refugees. These are the days, listen to me, these are the days when it takes a village to raise our children. If you see a parent struggling, by all means, go and help them out. These are the days when it will be a challenge as people lose jobs. We're going to have to help each other. These are the days when we're going to have to learn to homeschool as our schools become more infected by toxic indoctrination. Do I have the answers? No, I don't. Do I know what to do? No. Do I have a plan that's really clear and set in stone? No. But we will figure it out by the Spirit's leading. Psalm 84, verses 5 to 7, read this. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways 
to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. The highway to Zion is the pilgrimage that we all take. Zion is another word for Jerusalem, the city of God. See, as followers, as exiles, as sojourners, we are on that path. We ponder it. We give our heart to it. We read about it. We pray about it. And we have God gives us the strength to walk in it. But before we get to Zion, we go through the valley of Baca. And Baca in the original language means suffering, the valley of suffering. The valley of Baca had almost no water in it except during the early spring rains. But God's people make springs in it with their tears and their weeping. This isn't weakness. This isn't a lack of direction to wander. It's strength. It's strength to wander and not lose heart. It's strength as we keep walking. And as we keep walking, it leads to more strength. The scripture says that in the latter days, there will be a massive apostasy as people turn away from the faith. Did you know 65% of Christians in a recent poll said that they can be Christian alone and don't need one another? What we need right now is to not give up. We cannot afford to grow apathetic. We need to heed the warnings of Scripture so that our love does not grow cold. Now is the time to not grow faint-hearted, but to hold on, to not lose faith, faith, to keep our courage. Now is not the time to isolate yourself, but to press on and persevere. Is it annoying? Yes, with all of the restrictions. Is it frustrating? Yes, I hate wearing a mask. Are these things infuriating that I feel like I can't even send my kids to school anymore? Absolutely. But I'm a wanderer. And I feel like a stranger in my own country. And I'm in exile now than more than ever before. But... I am not lost, and we are not lost. I know exactly where I am going. I know exactly where we are going, and we will do it together. We are pilgrims on our way to the city of God. And as we travel, as people who do not fit in anywhere, we are reminded that we proclaim his excellencies and invite others to join us in the caravan. Think about these things. This is an identity that we have never had to learn as Americans, but we desperately need it now. I'll be praying for you as you process.